are going to be in Acts chapter 13. We are going to catch the last verse of chapter 12, but we're going to be in Acts chapter 13. We've been working our way through the book of Acts. Uh, we did take a break for Palm Sunday and Easter, and so far we've looked at the ministry of Peter, right? And, and then now we're going to be shifting to the ministry of Paul. Uh, so the first part of the book of Acts deals primarily with the, the ministry of Peter. We do have Paul's conversion in there, uh, but it really focuses on Jerusalem and Judea. So what we see in Acts 1.8, and Luke writes this, he says, And you will receive power, and the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world, right? And so we see that progression in the book of Acts. Luke is writing that. Now Luke is a writer, he would write the Gospel of Luke and he would write Acts. So he'd write the Gospel of, of Luke first and he ends that by saying, uh, you know, um, he, he, he kind of talks about the ascension of Jesus, but then Acts begins in my former book, Theophilus. So um, they maybe called him Theo, just to see if Theo's listening up there, right? Yeah, um, they maybe called him Theo, but uh, there was a person that Luke was writing to. So Luke was a physician, though. That's what he was by trade, but he would write uh, two key books in the New Testament, and he would accompany Paul on his missionary journeys. So some of his books, he, he was not an eyewitness that we are aware of, of the ministry of Jesus. So he would get that from sources like Peter and maybe Mary and other people that he would get uh, he would interview them, and that's how he recorded. He'd go look up the evidence. A very, a very good book. I mean, uh, Luke records a lot of details. Some of the other Gospels don't. All right? So last week we looked at, with the advancement of the Gospel, often it's, it, there's opposition that comes, right? Uh, hard times, though, call for earnest prayers. And so the context of that was that Peter was arrested. Um, Herod had James put to death, the brother of John. So James and John, he's put to death by the sword. It seemed to please the people, the Jewish religious leaders, and so he says, I'm going to get Peter. He arrests Peter. He's on trial. The day before he is to go on trial, an angel comes, releases Peter from prison, and um, he escapes, right? Um, pretty dramatic thing, but the church is praying for him, so it's kind of a good thing. If you want to go back and catch that, you can. And through prayer, the church advances. That's the way it ends, and that's just kind of a cool thing there. Um, the end of chapter 12 there, verse 24, but the Word of God continued to spread and to flourish. And so as the church prays, the church advances, regardless if there is opposition or favor, God's Word goes forth. Amen? And so the message today builds on that, and we're actually going to have the commissioning of Paul and Barnabas. Uh, so it's a cool thing. Um, you know, in biblical times... The church advanced. They, as I mentioned, they didn't have all the military strength. They didn't have. They were a small group of people that influenced the world. Um, in many ways, turned things upside down. Um, the Roman government was the strongest power at that time. They dominated the known world at that time, and and yet Christianity had a dramatic impact upon the Roman government. It even was a threat to them because it, instead of promoting pride and um, some of the virtues of the Roman government, they encouraged compassion and kindness, and they, they took care of other people. So it kind of threw off their equilibrium or a little bit, all right, and sometimes a lot of bit. They tried to squelch it through persecution. We know if you go back in history, you'll see the, the Colosseums where Christians were put into the Colosseums with lions and, and other things, um, even burned at the stake. But nothing stopped the church. It still advanced. Amen? And that's pretty cool. And even in more modern times, we've seen like in China where um, communism tried to squelch Christianity. Instead of squelching it, it spread and uh, continued to grow. All right. So the question I have, though, as the church goes forward, how do we know what we should do? How do we know what we should do as a church? Often... I can tell you in our day and age and culture, we go to the experts out there, right, in the field. The churches that are maybe growing or um, that are large or the authors, we go to those things. Some good resources there, all right? But the early church didn't have any of that. 
They did. They were kind of going out there blind, kind of like our fellowship when we started in 1914. Um, there wasn't a lot of research and people looked at us. We had great favor, folks. We grew significantly in those early days. It was very incredible. And so they all kind of looked at us and said, what are you doing? And we said, oh, I don't know. We pray, we seek God, and God blesses. So how do we discern the best way forward in times that we live in? Right now, the thing is, is that especially after COVID, our world is changing so fast, so fast. And that businesses and churches, everybody's just trying to keep up because things are changing so fast in our culture. Um, you kind of almost get whiplash, right? And so as the church, if we were to fulfill our, our vision and our mission, what God's called us to do, how do we do that? Um, so that's what I want us to answer that question and look at. What, is, what do we see in Scripture that helps us with that? So let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would speak to us in these moments that we have today. Uh, speak to us through your word, by your Holy Spirit. Make it come alive. It is the living word of God. We thank you. We praise you. We ask it in your name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's start in verse 25 of Acts chapter 12. So 12 deals with Peter's imprisonment and release from prison. We left off on verse 24. But we have to catch verse 25. A lot of your Bibles include that in the section of chapter 13. They include verse 25. It says, When Barnabas and Saul, and he'll be called both names, Saul was his Hebrew name, his Jewish name. Paul would be his Roman name. All right? And as you get more t into the book, it switches from Saul to Paul. All right? Okay? But... When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Okay? Now, they went on a mission. What was that mission? Well, you have to go back to chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, and you'll see that a prophet prophesied that there was going to be a famine in Jerusalem. And so... The church in Antioch took provisions, probably money and other things. They took it to Jerusalem, and the ambassadors were Paul and Saul. They took the provisions to Jerusalem. And so they bring and present those to the, the leadership in Jerusalem. And when they come back, they bring with them this man called John, also called Mark. We call him John Mark, all right? There's a little bit of history there. We'll talk a little more about him maybe next week is where I think I'm, we're going to look a little more at him. But we think that he is the one. He is the one that leaves in the Garden of Gethsemane the night that Jesus is betrayed. They try grabbing him. They grab his cloak and he takes off and he goes with no clothes on. He just, he just takes off. I mean, all the disciples fled, but he fled with nothing, right? All right. Um, and then we see a picture of him and he's going to go with Paul and Barnabas on this first missionary journey. So they bring him back from Jerusalem. He's with the church in Antioch. Antioch is in the north, um, uh, kind of southern, what would be called southern Syria at the point and time, and northern Israel, all right? So they bring with him John, also called Mark. Um, he would write our gospel called the Gospel of Mark, okay? All right. Verse 1, now in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, we know him, his name literally means son of encouragement. That's who he was. He was very instrumental in Paul's life and his discipleship and bringing him into ministry. Simon called Niger. So Niger was a key of his complexion, dark complexion. And we think that maybe he was the one that carried the cross for Christ. Remember, he collapses and there was a man that carried, we think that this maybe was him. There's some research or some evidence that maybe it was him. We don't know for sure. Lucius of Cyrene and, and Mannion, who had also been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So he grows up in Herod's household, and somehow he is reached by the gospel, and now is part of the early church in the leadership there in Antioch. It's pretty cool, huh? And then there was Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord in Antioch, they returned from this missions trip to Jerusalem. They return, they're worshiping the Lord and they're fasting. And it says the Holy Spirit. So you can underline that. All right. The Holy Spirit said, 
Now, I don't know how the Holy Spirit said. I think it spoke and witnessed to people's hearts, all right? But there was a confirmation of that, maybe through prophecy. But the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed hands on them and sent them off. All right? So, um, there's two things here in verse 2 that we want to look at. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them to. And then the church laid hands on them. So, Friday night we will have our light credentialing service at Lexington at our network council. I think we have upwards to 30 people-ish or more that are going to be either certified, licensed, or ordained. We have three levels. Uh, so Amy will be getting the license level. But it, in that process, we recognize the calling that is in people's lives that they have heard and that other people have witnessed in their life. And then it is that process of laying on of hands that we say as the church, we recognize God's calling in their life and we send them off in the power of the Holy Spirit. All right? That's what that is all about. And Amy and I were part of an ordination service Thursday night up in Lincoln for a lady that has been ministering here in Creed, different denomination. and It was interesting just seeing that. They actually do it within the church, and so the church was there, her home church, church she was baptized in, and then she's commissioned. And um, So it was kind of neat to see them surrounding her. And I was there just as the ministerial president here in, in Crete, and uh, just to share about what she does here. But there's a couple things to note here. First of all, it is, the God, God, it is God that calls us. So when we interview people for credentials, that is one of the, people can be gifted. Maybe they're a gifted speaker. They're just very charismatic, you know, just are really good with people. Or, you know, just good looking or, you know, they just have a lot of good things going for them. That's great. All right? That's great. But the most important thing is that there is that calling. What do I mean by that calling? That they sense from God that God has set them apart to do a work for Him. He has called them. Paul was called by God, right? On that road to Damascus, he was called. And he, God said there, I'm going to make you a light to the Gentiles. Now 11 years later, it is finally going to happen. It's finally going to take place. It wasn't immediate. He tried jumping into it real quick and he had a lot of opposition. They tried killing him and stuff like that. But he goes through a process. Now God says, now it's time to release you. So there is the call that people have to sense in their heart. If God has called you to full-time ministry, to be a pastor, a teacher, a prophet, a um, missionary, if God has called you, you know what? You can probably make money, more money doing other things, but you won't be happy doing those things because of that calling that is there. Now, you, maybe you, you want to be in ministry. You have all the giftings, but you don't have a call. You better go do what other things. That calling is really important, folks, that you sense that call. For some people, it is, very, it is just very clear. Maybe it's like God has spoken to them, like an audible voice has spoken to them. You know, Christy, you and Jim, I don't know what it was like for you guys. Um, you know, for me, it was more like, it was a gradual. I went to that my first year of Bible college and God began to work in my life. For Amy, she knew she was going to be a pastor's wife. And uh, that's something that we talked about when we were dating, right? She didn't want to date anybody that wasn't called to ministry because she really sensed that in her own life. That calling is important. And so when it says that set apart for me Paul and Saul, Barnabas and Saul for the work that I called them to, it was already something... I think Barnabas and Saul already felt the calling. And now the church was bearing witness to that, going to lay hands on them and commission them. All right? The first point, and Chris, I'm going to mix you up here a little bit, so stay with me on this, okay? All right. First point is that the Spirit sets us apart for ministry. All right? The Spirit sets us apart for ministry. He is the one that calls us. Now, just some scripture that goes with that. So now we're going to go back to Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. It says, this is what um, Paul says to the Ephesians. It says, these are the gifts that Christ gave the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, 
the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do the work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue to all come to such unity of faith and knowledge of God's Son that we may be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. It is God that calls and equips people with gifts to build His church. Amen? It is He that calls. Now, is everybody called to full-time ministry? No. But I believe everybody is called to ministry. It may not be full-time, but we're all called to be a witness, right? We're all called to be a, the light of Christ to the world around us. Maybe He hasn't called us to be a pastor or a teacher or a, um, a missionary, but He's called all of us to further the kingdom of God. And just to develop this idea of the, the Spirit um, recognizing people's gifts and how they fit in the body of Christ, Paul talks about this in Corinthians chapter 12. It's on the spiritual gifts, right? Which we are still believe are for today, whether it's prophecy, uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues, healing, right? But verse 4 says, there are different kinds of gifts but the same Spirit. And he distributes them. There are different kinds of service and kinds of working, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but all the same, and in every one is in the same God at work. Verse 7, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given the Spirit a message of wisdom. Okay, Where God is just going to drop in that word of wisdom for somebody. It's not wisdom or knowledge that is of your own um, knowledge. It is something that God places into your heart for someone else. Or to another of knowledge. So wisdom is how to use that knowledge or to proceed. Knowledge is just something maybe you're not aware of by that same Spirit. Verse 9, to another faith by that same Spirit. In other words, there's just that, that nugget of faith that is just kind of like over the top for a moment, a given time. Maybe it's for healing or for a miracle. And some of these overlap. To others, gifts of healing by that same Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, that's encouragement for the body of Christ, right? To build each other up. And to another distinguishing to be between spirits. We see Paul utilizing that with the uh, demon-possessed woman that they set free. That'll be coming up here and some of the other chapters. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. So we see that on the day of Pentecost as they spoke in other languages. And then the other to interpret those tongues. Paul says, I wish you, all of you would prophesy. Tongues are great, but it can't be understood unless they're interpreted. Pray that God could use you in the gift of prophecy, right? All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as... He determines. Now the way I would like, was that on his own doing? Was that his own thinking? No, I think it was the Holy Spirit that was guiding and directing him. And you'll notice that Paul is very strategic in reaching out to key leaders. Okay? We saw Peter reaching out to Cornelius and how Cornelius was this influential Roman centurion and how he was able to then influence other Jewish and Gentile believers in Caesarea and Joppa in that area. And now we see, you know, we're going to see here shortly that Paul is going to, to reach out to a key leader on this first journey, all right? But Paul was led by the, the Holy Spirit. He got his strategy by the Holy Spirit. And you see that throughout the book of Acts. And so the point we want to catch is that the Spirit guides us in ministry. There's a, a book written on missions, just the early part of AG Missions, and it's called The Strategy of the Spirit. And I actually got, had a class, um, the author taught a class for me on missions um, back a number of years ago. And uh, Everett Wilson, I think was his name. And it was entitled The Strategy of the Spirit because the assemblies saw incredible growth in the area of missions and right now we are poised to be the the largest missions organization in the world the assemblies of god is all right um but even back 30 40 years ago the other denominations were looking at us and say what are you guys doing what what are your keys we want your secrets to to missions growth and they just kind of said well we pray we seek god 
and we followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that was the keys to making the kingdom of God go forward. Um, and there's some things that we did well. We, we tried to work with the, the people in those countries and, and develop those ministries and so they don't become dependent upon the American church that they try to grow indigenously and, and uh, self-supporting. There's the three S's, I, you know, self-supporting, self-sufficient, um, self-governing. All right. Did I get them all, Christy? All right. Um, self-supporting. Self-governing. Remember the other one? What's that? Self-sufficient, yeah. And uh, and so, um, and that was keys. We really tried to get work started and then equip the local church to reach their own people, right? Um, that was the goal. And so that has continued on. And while in, in the United States, we kind of leveled off. That's the honest truth, okay? That's the honest truth. But in the area of missions around the world, we're still seeing incredible growth, all right? The strategy of the Spirit. I believe that the Holy Spirit is able to guide and direct us. There's nothing wrong with getting research out there and finding out where we are as a nation and getting, uh, looking at what other people have done, but I still think there's something to um, getting... Um, Hearing the heart of God, seeking the face of God, and uh, trusting Him. There's the map there. And Chris, if you can uh, deal with the flashing light, if not, that's great, but it, it's, it's strobing me. All right. Um, all right, let's go on to point number three. Six through twelve. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Pathos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer. Ooh. The false prophet named Bar Jesus. And he was an attendant of the proconsul. A proconsul was like a governor. He was he was in charge of an area of land sectioned off by the Roman government and the Roman Senate. And he was put in charge of that. So it'd be like a governor of our state, this proconsul was. And so Paul is meeting with him and um, Sergius Paulus. Okay, and the proconsul was an intelligent man sent from Bar and uh, sent he sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Eliamus, the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and he tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the what? Holy Spirit. So each point here talks about the Holy Spirit. Looked straight at Eliamus, looked him in the eyes. Right? This is an intense moment. You are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. Woo! And you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You will never stop perverting the ways of the Lord. And now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time. And not even, not even able to see the light of sun. You know, it's kind of interesting. Paul had the same thing happen to him wasn't when he, in his conversion, did he not? Where he was blinded. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. And, you know, he, his name means he was a sorcerer, black magic. Is, he was a magician, is what Elimus was. And, um, and so now he was going to walk around in darkness and not see the light of the sun for a time. Immediately a mist came over him, darkness, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed and he was amazed. You know, to confront evil and even reach people of power and position and influence takes a little bit of guts. It takes some courage, doesn't it? I mean, you have to think, Paul and Barnabas were nobodies to this, this governor, this, pre this proconsul, right? They were nobodies, and yet they had an audience. Paul would even have an audience with King Agrippa and other people he would be brought before them, the, the great powers of the world at that time. And he would present with boldness and talk to them about their relationship with Christ. I think Paul had a giftedness of speaking, and I think he, he did have some boldness, but I think he also needed the power of the Holy Spirit to help him. I definitely do, and I think Paul did as well. And it specifically says that he was filled 
with the Holy Spirit. He confronts evil and then he talks to this man. Both Peter and Paul seemed like take charge people, but when they are filled with the Holy Spirit, God enabled them to fulfill what God had called them to do and to take that gospel witness to where he was calling them. This is what scholars believe about this proconsul, Sergius Paulus. He became a well-known leader in Christian circles. This is according, according to secular history, not from the Bible, just from historical history. He became a well-known leader in Christian circles, and both him and his, his, his daughter and his son would be distinguished by their devotion to the Christian faith through that encounter. And so in that the Holy Spirit gave Paul b boldness to deal with the evil that was there and to take advantage of the opportunity of this man reaching out. And through that, the gospel was advanced. Amen? Pretty powerful story. And we're going to learn next week how it impacted John Mark. All right? But we see the Holy Spirit guiding Paul and Barnabas. We also see that the Holy Spirit equipped him with courage. I'm going to have the musicians come. You know, the Holy Spirit was setting Paul and Barnabas apart for a specific ministry. He guided them in that ministry, and he provided the courage and the boldness to carry it out. The strategy was by the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes it's nice to have a book, a textbook, and say, do this, 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 and this. Especially if you're that type of person that likes those lists, right? And likes things just kind of spelled out and say, do this, 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 and this. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to guide His people. He wants to guide you and He wants to guide His church. But as some of those times don't always come out of a textbook. They may come out of Scripture. But even more so, it comes out of times of prayer and fasting. Amen? Where we see God's face that God speaks to his people. I think some of the things that have gone the best for our church, we've taken advantage of resources that are out there, but also just following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Crete isn't like every place, right? There's other places like Crete. But Crete has some uniquenesses, right? And he, God's positioned us in a, in a place where we also reach to Western and Wilbur, up as Lincoln to Seward. And we have a diverse population, right? But I believe God can give us the Holy Spirit to allow us to fulfill our vision to lead, love, and connect people here to that life-changing relationship with Christ. What am I asking you today? One, first of all, I have a couple questions for you, like four or five. Is God calling you to full-time ministry? Do you have an open heart if God is calling you? And um, I know some people are very gifted and they can do a lot of different things. All I know is that if, if God is calling you and you hear that call, you can do a lot of things. You can even make a lot of money. But if that's not where you're supposed to be, you're not going to be fulfilled in that. People have left companies and organizations making millions of dollars to go into ministry because they weren't fulfilled. They knew that God had a calling upon their life. Amen? So, I can't call you. Now, sometimes as a pastor, I recognize giftings in people, so I try to call that out. Okay? I try to call that out if I sense that. But I can't call. God has to call. One of our sons specifically has really asked about that is trying to navigate through that. And, um, and so, but, you know, what I've told them is, God, has, you have to sense that call. You know, you have to sense that call. How is God wanting you to use your gifts, your talents, your time, your treasure to further his kingdom? Have you asked the Holy Spirit? Have you asked God saying, God, how do you want to utilize my gifts and talents, my time, my treasure to further your kingdom. Number four, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? It's great if you were filled 10 years ago, a year ago. But this morning when you entered this place, 
could you be described as that your life is filled with the Holy Spirit? If not, that's okay. God's here. He wants to fill us before we leave, right? Do you sense His empowering presence in and upon your life? And not, if not, I just pray that your heart is open and say, God, come, I need that pres- your presence in my life. I need the fullness of the Holy Spirit in my life to live for you, but also to be a witness for you. Amen? Would you stand this morning? I'm going to lead us in a prayer of salvation because it begins there. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and your Savior, Scripture says if you believe in your heart that Christ is Lord, confess Him as your Lord and your Savior, you will be saved. You will be saved. So the prayer of salvation is important. But that's just the beginning. There's a lot of people that have prayed the prayer of faith and it's never gone beyond that point. That's the start. And then you say, God, now here's my life. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to live according to your word. I'm going to be part of a church and walk with you and be who you've called me to be. So let's look to the Lord this morning. If I'm going to encourage you all to pray, but if this is your first time, you need to find me and fill out that connect card and say, I made that commitment to Christ. Maybe I rededicated my life or I, I prayed for the first time saying, Dear God, come into my heart and into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me and purify me. Be my Lord and my Savior. And I give you my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And for the rest of us here, for all of us here, will you just make this your prayer and say, Dear God, come into this place and come into this, into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit this morning. Let your empowering presence be upon my life. Lead and direct me in every pathway. May I sense the gifts in my life and what you've called me to do. Let me glorify you in all that I do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise God. Let's sing this song together.
just sensing God's presence here this morning. Father, we are your people. And you love us with an everlasting love. And you call us into relationship with you. Lord God, as we leave this place today, let us do so in the power of your Spirit, in the fullness of your Spirit. Lord, we're just clay vessels. We have cracks, flaws, but you've chosen to fill us and place your spirit within these earthen vessels so that your all-surpassing power may shine through that. Through our flaws, through our humanness, through our humanity. And so, Lord God, my prayer is that, that your surpassing power shine through these clay vessels this week. Shape and mold us, perfect us, I pray. But God, shine through us. It's not about us, Lord God. It's not about the vessel. It's about the gift of God that resides within us. We give you the thanks and the praise. We ask it in your precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Hey, God bless you this morning.